A Musical Life with cultural arts writer, lecturer, and novelist Norman Lebrecht. Norman Lebrecht is one of the foremost cultural writers and classical music reviewers today. In addition to his columns for The Daily Telegraph and The Standpoint, he's been a host on BBC Three Radio, and his first novel, The Song of Names, is in the process of being adapted into a major motion picture. Norman has written extensively on the business side of classical music, and his website, Slipped Disc, is one of the most widely read resources for classical music and art news. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. Journalist, writer, novelist, broadcaster, lecturer, Norman Labrecht is easily one of the most prolific commentators on culture and the classical music arts. In addition to all his accomplishments and 12 books under his belt, Norman is an expert on the music of the 19th century Austrian Jewish composer and conductor Gustav Mahler. I think you're going to really enjoy this fascinating conversation with a man who has spent his life exploring the meaning and message found in classical music. Norman, thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Good to meet you here, you. You as well. I've been reading and following you for many years, and you're well known as a person who identifies the best as well as the worst in classical music. Now, for folks who are new to classical music, I'm wondering what two or three recordings would you recommend to help them fall in love with the art form? Whoa. <laughs> just, just like that. Off the top of my head. Well, Whoa. perhaps. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or, 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 uh, do you know what? I'm just going to, I'm, I do a, um, I do an album of the week and I'm just going to scroll back over the last few. That would be lovely. Um, Absolutely. Think, um, you know, just, just to find some that would get you there. I, hear, I mean, straight away, you know, this is a, a new recording on Decca of the 44 duos duos by Bella Bartok for two violins. Oh, lovely. Which are, I mean, they were written actually essentially as exercises for young violinists to, to achieve uh, perfection in their technique, but they become performing pieces. And these are actually recorded by two Romanian-born French sisters, each of whom is concert master of a different orchestra in Paris. Oh, wow. And the two young women come together to do these pieces, which they've known all their lives, which they've played all their lives. They're now in the middle of their 30s. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful exercise in communication. And that's one of the best things that classical music does. It connects people. Mm. And it shows you, it's a demonstration, a manifestation of how we, in our mortal loneliness, can actually connect to another living human being. So, I, I, oh, goodness, start with, that, <laughs> start with that Bartok. I mean, where, where else can I take you then? That is a, that is a magnificent <laughs> um, recommendation. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, there is so much. There is just so much to choose from. I think that's what's so intimidating, I think, for new listeners, that they see a, a, just so many options and so many varieties and genres within the classical music genres. It can be very intimidating for listeners, brand new listeners, to even get started. So that's why I wanted to tap into some of your recommendations. It's about... It's like anything else in life. It's about the human quality. It's about the people who wrote it, and it's about the people who played it. My album of the year last year was a pianist of 91 years old ah. who had spent most of his life in a trio, a very famous, very successful trio called the Beaux-Arts Trio. Mm. But when that broke up in his 80s, uh, he looked around and he suddenly found himself as probably the best teacher of chamber music anywhere in the world. Menachem Pessler, yes. You got it. Yes. <laughs> you got it. You got it. And he started getting invitations from major orchestras uh, to perform with them, to play 
concertos. He hadn't played concertos until his 20s. He's now 91. My goodness. And this is a Mozart concerto that he played with the Berlin Philharmonic. This is somebody who had to leave Germany in 1939. The Nazis chased him out when he was 17 years old. He's now 91 years old. And he's come back and he's playing a Mozart concerto with the Berlin Philharmonic on New Year's Eve on national television. Oh, wow. Oh, Everything. My Everything coming together and to watch that on DVD or to listen to it as an album, you get a purchase on what has passed in the century, on what, what people have been through, on the sacrifices that they've made in order to become musicians and on the wisdom that they have to convey as musicians. You listen to that, you are a different person. You know, we had a professor at the Curtis Institute of Music, Mieczysław Horzowski, right. who was performing just days before he, he, he passed away at the age of 99. He almost became 100 years old. <laughs> and I remember sitting in one of his performances. I think he was 98, a spry young 98 years old. And I completely concur when you hear the wisdom, the profound communication in somebody who has lived such an incredible lifetime. Music communicates in such a powerful way that way. Yes. That's right. And more than that, you. I, mean, I had breakfast with Menachem last week. I always do when he comes through. And I would never miss an opportunity of seeing him. He has the curiosity of a 17-year-old. He has these wide open eyes on the world. He wants to know what's going on. He wants to know the meaning of things. To be able to maintain that through a long life, yes, that's one of the gifts of music. Because music is a constant learning curve. You're, you can never settle on what you know or what you think you know. Every day, in every way, you've got to learn some more. And it's remarkable. I think there's something in music itself, particularly classical music, that seems to keep the brain young. My current piano teacher, Eleanor Sokolov, is still teaching at the age of 101 at Curtis. Can you believe that? She is extraordinary. She is a legend of Philadelphia. <laughs> of the world, yeah. I would say. And of, it seems the world. many indeed, musicians indeed. seem to but, that, but But yes, that's what it does. We don't know how the musical part of the brain functions. All that we know is that it is probably the first part of the brain to be alerted to external stimuli. You know it when you see a little baby and you start singing to him or her. And certainly the last part of the brain to degenerate when um, serious conditions like Alzheimer's set in. You may know um, the Oliver Sacks case history, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, <laughs> which was also made into an opera by Michael Nyman, a small opera, but very, very beautiful, very profound, very moving, yes. um, in which a former singer who has lost all other capacity, uh, who doesn't recognize his wife, who thinks she is his hat. Oh, my is still able to tie his shoelaces, which is a complex motor phenomenon. Um, you don't learn to, to tie shoelaces until you're about five years old. Um, but still, with everything else, every other motor faculty having gone, he can still tie his shoelaces. And Oliver Sacks observes him and realizes that something else is going on because he hears a sound coming from him and it is the man's music. He is singing a Schumann song, Ich Grolle Misch. The whole of his memory is gone. All that remains is this Schumann song that enables him to tie his shoes, that enables him to, to maintain his last link with this world. Ah, how profound. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot again, if you don't mind. I'm wondering, <laughs> for, for folks who are fortunate enough, now we've talked about recordings, but for folks mm. who are fortunate enough to live close to a venue to hear great music live, mm. what artists or orchestras or ensembles would you recommend that they keep an eye out for? 
Oh, you know, there are so many of you. I wouldn't want to recognize <laughs> one above the other. And, and, and any, you know, and there's a risk of understatement. There's a risk of disappointment because musicians are humans. They have good days. They have bad days. They Very have true. some terrible days. Very true. So if I said to you this orchestra or that orchestra, you know, if you, well, if you're living in Philadelphia, there's the Philadelphia Orchestra. You ain't got any other show in town. <laughs> if, you're living, if you're living in New York, there's the New York Philharmonic. You may have others coming through. Um, and no, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. But I, I think you just follow your instincts. You look at the artists uh, that intrigue you. You go and listen to them. Um, if there is a connection, then that connection will deepen over your life. And I've, I've had right through my life artists that I will always cross the ocean to see and others that I wouldn't cross the road to see. <laughs> Very <So> well put. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they fall into those categories because, you know, if somebody really lets you down, if you go and the, the recital is dull or it's underprepared or it's uncommitted, then you don't want to hear that artist again. Mm. Um, but if it's somebody who has opened a window onto something that you'd never dreamed of, imagined before, then then that's wonderful and you stick with that person for the rest of your life. And then when you come across a young artist whom you hear for the first time and you realize that this is, this is one of them, <laughs> this is one of the few, yes. this is, you know, this is an artist for the rest of your life and he or she is only 19 or 20. Well, there, there are a few greater excitements than that. It's really the thrill of discovery the thrill of the exploration as well, isn't it? Constant discovery. The thrill of discovery and the flight from tedium, the flight from boredom. There is so much boredom in the world. There's so much that we do in order to pass the time between cradle and grave or between dinner time and bed. Ah. And, and we shouldn't have to do that because there is so much else that is out there to stimulate it. And so, so much of it comes under this category that we know as music. Now, for more serious music lovers or stu perhaps conservatory students who are getting ready to prepare for a professional career, for those folks looking to expand their musical mm -hmm. horizons beyond the so-called traditional fair, mm -hmm. what works and or composers would you recommend that they start exploring? My first advice to anybody contemplating a music career is don't. Uh, <laughs> it, it's one of those things yes. like... Um, like being a priest or a rabbi, you really shouldn't do it unless you absolutely have to. Mm. Unless you have a sense of, of mission, unless you're driven to do it. If you're just do it, doing it because you're good at it and because you, or because you can't think of anything better to do, um, don't do it. Or because, you know, all your friends are doing it and it's fun. Don't do it. Mm. Don't do it because it's going to disappoint you. It's going to let you down in your 40s. Mm. So um, one of my constant beefs, and I've lectured on this in conservatories around the world, is, is that the way that we teach music, the way that we, we prepare young people for a life in music is ossified. It's, it, it, it is completely sclerotic. We are still training people in the way that we trained them 100 years ago. Nothing true. else nothing else in the world here is as it was 100 years ago. Nothing is as it was 10 years ago, except music conservatories, which are frozen in time and are still trying to ape our grandparents. We have to shake them out of this, and we have to shake young people out of the expectation that there is a music career out there waiting for them. There isn't. Mm. You're going to have to go and find it, and you're going to have to grab it by the horns. Yes, yes, very, very true. Well, I, I'd like to shift the focus on yourself. Your career has largely been focused on interviewing and reviewing other artists, but I understand that before becoming one of the world's most prolific music and cultural commentators, you were actually a student of the Talmud and oh, rabbinic was... and rabbinic debate. What influence has Judaism and your religious training had in informing your style of engagement in the public conversation about culture and music? Oh, um, probably more than I know and more than I have time to tell in, <laughs> in this particular interview. Um, what you need to know about Talmudic discourse is that it's confrontational. Um, no text is considered sacred. Any text is there for deconstruction, and you argue things out with no holds barred. So one of the things that you learn to do at a very, very young age is deconstruction, defense of your position, and the pursuit of intellectual clarity. That's not a bad training for being a writer. I started out as a television news journalist, producer, 
I was covering wars and elections and earthquakes and new pandas being born at the zoo, as you do. <laughs> um, and that was that was in my 20s. And I found that unsatisfying. And one of the things that really just lit up all my buttons was classical music and the why of classical music. And nobody seemed to be answering the why. So I started investigating and trying to answer the why myself. And that's what I spent much of my life doing. I've written a great deal, enormous amount, probably too much about classical music, <laughs> both as a, as a newspaper columnist for many years, 12 books, which seems an awful lot. But I'm also a novelist. I've written many other things and I'm a broadcaster and I've made films and, and so on and so forth. So it's been a rich and varied life. But music has been the constant strand through it. And I've never for one moment regretted that. Did you have musical training as a child, as a young man? I did uh, piano and violin as a kid. Um, I hated the violin. <laughs> I just hated the sounds that I made on it. I quite liked the piano, but I had pretty poor left hand, left right coordination. Uh, my brain just didn't function that way. And as soon as I turned on the radio and heard somebody doing it so much better than I was, you know, <laughs> Arthur Rubinstein is on the radio. What am I doing playing the piano? Um, so I gave up quite early on. I, I had a piano chiefly just to help me to read scores. But I, I never actually played for pleasure because other people could give so much pleasure, more pleasure than I could. <laughs> now, did you ever have thoughts of about becoming a rabbi at any point? No, no. Mm. Um, um, that was, as I said, you know, a, a musician and rabbi, unless you absolutely have to do it, <laughs> cross the road, do something else. <laughs> so, no, I didn't have, I didn't have that calling, um, and it really is a calling. I respect those who do. Um, I think as a writer, you can... Um, perhaps do something to help people out of their confusions. You can help them get greater clarity in their lives and a better understanding of who they are. Um, that's about as far of a sense of mission as I've got. I, the other thing is, it's what I do. I love writing. Mm. I, mean, I get up in the morning and I face a blank screen. Whoa, that says, that blank screen spells opportunity to me. <laughs> it's get it out there. That is marvelous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. You, it just, you, you've mentioned the discipline of deconstructionism and, and the lack of sanctity for whatever is written and this tremendous analytical mind that you've developed through your Talmudic studies. I'm wondering if you could also comment on any other ways that you've continued to live your Judaism through your work. Um, I take an ethical position on most things. Um, I do believe in right and wrong. Um, and I don't like going down the very, very broad line between them. Um, I like to stand on one side of the barricade. Uh, I suppose, yes, that's what I do. The other thing is one of my specialist fields has been Gustav Mahler. I've written two books about him. And um, in Mahler, unless you have an understanding of his Jewish background, unless you appreciate the rhetoric that he is using in music, the way that he involves a particular kind of irony, the way that, the way that he makes music work to, um, to engage with social issues, to be moral and ethical, um, then I don't think you have really have a full understanding of Mahler. So it, it's, um, it's not as though I'm trying to apply any vicarious set of values on Mahler, but what Mahler does in his music is so revolutionary because he has taken um, something of his own heritage and applied it to the Western heritage. I'm going to touch a little bit on your work with Mahler in just a bit, but getting back to your prolific work as a writer and the books that you have published, of course, you've uh, mentioned the books on music, but you've also had tremendous success as a novelist. And I understand that your very first novel, it's award-winning novel, The Song of Names, is it still in the process of being developed into a film, I understand, with Dustin Hoffman and, am I correct, Anthony Hoff Hopkins well, as well? Well, it was going to be Dustin Hoffman and Anthony Hopkins, but that's 10 years ago, and I'm afraid <laughs> they've, missed, they've missed the boat. Oh, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Um, no, we now have a new lead producer, and things are actually hotting up. We have a very good director. Wonderful. And we, have a sh we have a shooting schedule for the summer of 2017. I can't say anything more at the moment. But uh, the project has revived, and it does look as though the Song of Names is going to become 
um, a, a serious feature film, which oh, com- is wonderful. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. How exciting. You. It, would you Thank be, you. I, I know you're not able to say much, but are you able to share the synopsis of your novel? Just a brief synopsis? And the synopsis is very simple. It's two boys growing up in wartime London. One of them is a genius. The other isn't. But they have a kind of symbiotic relationship in which one of the boys, as it were, enables the other boy to express his particular gift. He is a violinist. Um, they have the closest of friendships. And then on the day of his international debut, the violinist disappears. That's the beginning. <laughs> ah, lovely. I cannot wait. I'll have to read the book before I catch the movie, I think. <laughs> now, Good. in addition to your work with traditional media, you've been in television, print and radio, of course. You've actually now had have had tremendous success as a blogger. Your blog, Slipped Disc, is one of the most widely read, if not the most widely read, classical music and culture blogs. First, I, my first question is, what is the origin of the name Slipped Disc? It sounds like a medical condition. <laughs> uh, it is a medical condition, among other things. The origin of the name is that uh, one of the things that I was writing about was the decline and fall of the record industry, which uh... would be a pillar of, of musical life for almost a century and uh, was spiraling into disintegration from the mid-90s onwards. And I'd been the leading commentator on that and I'd written a book um, called uh, The Life and Death of Classical Music, which was the whole history of classical recording. And so Slip Disc was a kind of a, a hint towards that. But I don't like the term blog and I don't like the term blogger. Where, where it arose is this. I'd had a long career in journalism. I was assistant editor of one of the national newspapers here in England. And I could see that newspapers were following the decline of classical recording and and many other forms in my life. And um, it didn't seem as though anything was going to be stopping it. So when um, a Russian KGB man stepped in to buy the newspaper of which I was associate editor, I thought, well, I've never worked with the KGB before. <laughs> I'm going to start now. So I, 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 having written various papers on how journalism could regenerate itself, I thought I should try and put this into practice by starting Slip Disc. And, um, and it's been an experimental process to see how it developed. How it's developed is beyond anyone's imagination. You know, I was told at the beginning um, that nobody, no no blogger in any of the arts had ever had more than 10,000 readers on a day. Uh, slip disc habitually gets 50, 60,000. My readers, goodness. Wow. 1.5 million readers a month. Oh, that's incredible. So that, that then becomes, if you like, the central notice board for classical music, the place that people have to go to to read what's going on, the place that people have to go to to communicate what's going on. So part of journalism, the hardest part of journalism was was always going out and finding a story. I don't have to go out and find a story. (laughs) You know, I just, I turn on my computer in the morning and there are half a dozen emails overnight with things which, with experience, a little bit of checking, uh, turn out to be really interesting, go straight up on slip disk. Mm, I mm. do that for about an hour and then I get back to my real work. (laughs) Now, speaking as an entrepreneur, if you don't mind, would Mm. would you be able to share any tips as to how you've been able to grow such a massive readership. As, as you mentioned, most people you know, disparage how difficult it is to get more than a few thousand readers a day, and you've just succeeded so remarkably in reaching such a commanding audience. Hugh, if I knew, I would tell you. <laughs> Honest, no, honestly, I would, but I don't, because mm. it, 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 it's, um, it has developed. It, it, it acquired its own momentum. You kind of reach a tipping point, and suddenly you realize you're dealing with vast numbers of people who are taking an interest in what you're doing. I think what it is is, okay, I had something of a reputation beforehand. A lot of people trusted me. Some don't. Um, <laughs> and, or, or, you know, some think that I'm the devil incarnate. Uh, they're, they're entitled to their opinion. Um, and, and some get seriously disgruntled when I expose their wrong, wrongdoing. Mm. I wouldn't have it any other way. I would mm. like them to be disgruntled. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it, you know, so it just, it just grew. What the more difficult thing is how one, uh, entrepreneurially speaking, is how one makes a business of this, how one persuades people to invest in it, and basically what... Um, 
what investors are telling me at the moment is that I don't really need to do anything more. The critical mass is there. And they want to pick it up and 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 move it on to turn it into a a viable business. So we shall see. It's not something in which I have any expertise whatsoever. Um, but it's been it's been salutary. It's been salutary because it shows both the strengths and the limitations of the classical music world. It particularly exposes the fears and anxieties and the timidities and the way that even the most successful musicians are always worried whether when they get up in the morning next day, anybody will remember them, mm. uh, which, is, which, is, which is the life of an artist. That's very, very true. Does the site provide a livable wage at this point? or No, ah, no. Interesting. Um, it, it, it provides a certain amount of money. It doesn't do what I what I targeted it to do by now, which is deploy, em, employ enough people so that I don't have very much to do with it and I can get on with the rest of my life. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping we're going to be getting there and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to train in the next generation of slip disc writers. Mm. Um, we're certainly talking about that at the moment. And um, establish it as a place that musicians know as a place they can trust. Mm. Uh, there is an an absolute rule of no abuse. People who um, who, who, who try to publish uh, unpleasant things on the site are spammed out. So it's a place where musicians can feel safe. It's a place where music lovers can feel safe, and where they can trust the information. So mm. that 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 seems to be all of the secret. But I can't, you know, if 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 somebody else had done it. I, or, or done something similar, I could sit back and say, oh, you know, we had both been doing the same things at around the same time, but actually we haven't. I seem to be the only one out there. Ah, fascinating. Now, the internet have, has upended music distribution and performance models, as well as we mentioned, as well as traditional print and media outlets. And you've clearly been able to straddle both traditional and internet platforms for your writing quite successfully. Now, given your background, as a host for BBC Three Radio, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the rising popularity of alternative mediums like podcasts. I think um, technology has taken us by the ears and is shaking us um, in ways that we can barely conceive. I think what you're doing on podcasts and what other people are doing on internet radio is making old-fashioned radio and network television look antediluvian, look like dinosaurs, mm. um, because the technology now enables the, the provider of music or the provider of information to have a pretty good idea of what the audience is going to want. People who sign on to anything are actually disclosing their preferences and their tendencies. And so the future is going to be some kind of streaming, but it'll be a very, very personalized streaming, which will enable the consumer to allow the producer um, to determine how much he wants to be led. Um, it's rather like going to make um, an investment. When you go and see an investment specialist, the first question they'll say to you is what level of risk do you want? Mm. Do you want absolute safety or do you want reckless or <laughs> somewhere or somewhere in between? And, and that's really how it's going to work on streaming and internet radio on the future, that the, the provider, the producer, will have a certain amount of data about each individual listener and each listener will have indicated their comfort zone. Some will have a very, very broad zone, so they'll, they'll be prepared to experiment. And the producer, which is itself a computer, <laughs> will be <laughs> able to lead them to places they've never imagined. Um, and others will have a very, very narrow safety zone. Mm. They're, you know, I, I, I don't want to risk anything in my investment. And they will spend the rest of their lives listening to Mozart, Piano, Concerto, Kirchhoff, 467. <laughs> Now, you've written extensively about the decline of the classical music industry 
And as you mentioned in your book, you actually foretold the collapse of the record industry in your book in the USA. It's titled Who Killed Classical Music way no, back in 1997. Not my, not my title. <laughs> not my title. <laughs> and, and the publisher who provided that title went bust. I'm oh, glad. well, there you go. <laughs> now, we see Owing these- me a lot of money. I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, we see these problems, of course, throughout yep. the music industry across all genres, not just classical music. But mm -hmm. you, you've also pointed pointed out the tenacity of artists who have bypassed the so-called cultural gatekeepers to create their own audiences and careers, really thanks to the internet. One example that you interviewed was Valentina Lisitsa, a, mm. a Ukrainian pianist who came out of nowhere selling, I think at one point, some beam mixers to scrape a living. Yep. And then she created a staggering following of millions of viewers just by posting YouTube videos of her own piano playing. I'm wondering if there are any other examples like Valentina's that give you hope for the future of classical music. Oh my goodness, there, there are so many. I mean, I, 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 I've actually never been more positive and more optimistic about the future of classical music than I am now, because uh -huh. there are two streams of, of musicians who are coming through who are aware that old systems, the old systems are broken down. There is no more career to be made through recording. There is no more a career to be made through most agents. Um, the musician of the future will make his or her own career by finding a niche and expressing it. Valentina Lisitsa was one of the first to post classical videos on uh, YouTube, and she reaped a whirlwind, 60 million followers. Mm. Unbelievable for classical music. And then she ran into trouble by getting in too much involved in Soviet Ukrainian politics, um, <laughs> but 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 she certainly blazed a path that many others have followed and will continue to follow. And I see lots of young musicians who are constantly trying to think about how can we do this a different way. I mean, there's an example just last night. This is really hot off the presses. Um, just last night, there was a harpsichord recital in Cologne, uh, a very staid and conservative part of West Germany, which erupted in a riot. <laughs> a harpsichord recital. <laughs> a harpsichord recital. Probably the first riot at any harpsichord recital in history. Because the young musician, who is a friend of mine called Mahana Sohani, he's uh, um, Iranian and uh, was raised in the United States. But he has... Um, he thinks the harpsichord is a contemporary instrument. He doesn't think it ended in the Baroque and was superseded by the piano. He tries to relate the harpsichord to uh, present-day realities. And among other things, he persuaded uh, Steve Reich to let him uh, do a transcription of piano phase for the harpsichord. It sounds fantastic. Wow. It sounds equally fantastic when Mahan plays Microcosmos, Bartok, mm. on the harpsichord. But when you put this in front of a Sunday afternoon crowd of middle-class, middle-aged people in Cologne, they riot, <laughs> which, which is absolutely wonderful. Mm. Um, you know, nothing has probably stirred them so much since puberty. <laughs> and that gives one hope and confidence in the future of classical music. There are people like Mahan around who can do things differently and their audience are going to respond to it. Even their negative response is worth more than polite applause. Absolutely. It, it's, it's what we dream of, making people move in some yeah. direction. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I said to him after the recital, he rang me. I, I, I said, Mahana, you're right. He said, all right. It's the best thing that could have happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> How marvelous. How astounding. Well, I, I want to delve back to you a bit. We're, we're mm. talking about the future of music, but in several of your interviews, mm. I was struck by your references to the biblical prophet Jeremiah, the, uh. the weeping prophet, who in the biblical accounts foretold calamity but was rejected by his own people. 
And it's really interesting. You mentioned at one point his connection to the 19th century Austrian Jewish composer, as we you just discussed, you're, you have expertise in the Austrian Jewish composer Gustav Mahler, whose own works were largely forgotten, as you mentioned, during his own lifetime. But he seemed to have a cultural prescience with audiences in the 21st century, as well as a profound transformational and healing and healing effect on modern listeners. I, I'm wondering, do you identify with the story of Jeremiah? Oh, very much so. I mean, Jeremiah is a prophet who went around saying to the people, um, this is what you're doing is terribly wrong. If you persist in this, the city is going to be destroyed and we are all going to be sent into exile. We're going to become refugees. And when the city was destroyed and everybody went into exile, Jeremiah led them into the desert, offering words of consolation, saying, we will return. That's the role of, of leadership, to, to, to warn, to predict, to try and plan for a future, and always to comfort and console. Gustav Mahler and his symphonies has some of the most terrifying warnings in the whole of Western music. The opening of the Sixth Symphony, Klaus Tenstedt, one of the, the great conductors of my life, said, when he first looked at that score, he saw in it two world wars and a holocaust. Those mm. opening bars, boom, 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 was, was, were, were armies marching over Europe, marching over the world and dealing death and destruction. Now here is Mahler warning that if we don't get our act together, if we don't strive for equality within society, if we don't offer equal, equal opportunity, we are sowing the seeds of a future conflagration. Identify with that very much, yes. Do you feel like the critic is doomed to be criticized no matter what he says? I no longer know what a critic is. I mean, the critic was once a, a powerful figure in society because newspapers were powerful in society. Now newspapers are marginal and critics are nowhere. So uh, the, the role, I, I used to be a great defender of the role of criticism, but that, but that role is an evanescent of itself. How we create a new criticism, how we create a new dialogue around music is one of the really, really big challenges for the future of music over the next decade. We need to create new, we need to find a new language and a new space for dealing with the act of performance, describing the act of performance, engaging with it, and encouraging others to attend. Mm. I'd like to close with an interesting report that was that Forbes reported on. This is the result of the Harris study on millennials. And mm. I'm, I'm going to just read this as a quote. This is, quote, more than three in four millennials, about 78%, this is quite astounding, would choose to spend money on an experience or event over buying something desirable. Millennials want to spend their money being with others. And 69% of the respondents said they believe attending live experiences helps them connect better with friends, their community, and people around the world. And it, 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 again, it goes on to say that it's extraordinarily high numbers of young people today want to participate, want to attend live events rather than buy cars. They're more, they're just as happy to rent rather than purchase. Now, this sounds, of course, like extraordinarily bad news for the recording industry, which is perhaps beyond dead, but a huge opportunity for performers with the imagination and innovation to create experiences that tap into that millennial desire for meaning and culture. I'm wondering, what is your perspective on the role of classical music and the millennial culture? I think there's a tremendous opportunity out there. We have to think outside the box. We have to uh, reject many of our past fixities, which are there either because they conform to a certain tradition or because 
um, certain agreements with unions or or with funders have kept them in place. I mean, why why we still have concerts at seven thirty or eight in the evening and hope that we're <laughs> going to get young people to go there when young people don't leave the house until ten at night? <laughs> it, it completely bewilders me. Um, one of the problems with classical music it is is that it is clung too long to fixities and uh, externalities and. I think we need to question everything that we do. We need to challenge everything that we do. And every time we do it, we have success. Every time we do it, we, the, 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 the younger musicians who look at their world as distinct from the establishment that, that has embraced them are able to, to, to shake things up and, and um, reimagine the concert experience because that's really what we have to do. Who says a concert has to last two two hours, two and a half hours? Why shouldn't it last thirty minutes? Mm. Or why shouldn't it be at different times of day and night? How can we configure our musical economy to make that work? How can we engage with audiences in different ways? I was in Los Angeles a couple of years ago working with Gustavo Dudamel. He was doing a Mahler cycle. We were doing Mahler 6 and I was going to be doing, I was giving a couple of talks before performances. I was going to do a talk before Mahler 6 and I said to him, Gustavo, what do people do after Mahler 6? You can't go to a restaurant uh. because you've just, it, it, it is the blackest ending of any symphony ever written. Mm. Herbert von Karajan said that. I mean, it leaves you with very little room for hope. Um, so he said, well, what do you think? What can we do? I said, we can do a psychoanalysis. Um, so, we announced before the performance that anybody in the audience who wanted to stay on afterwards could do so and discuss it with me and discuss what they felt and how how can they uh, assimilate the experience of Mahler's Sixth Symphony into the rest of their day and the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so after the musicians left the stage, I got up on the stage. And to my astonishment, there was something like six or 700 people. Oh, my who stayed behind yeah. to have 45 minutes, 50 minutes of psychoanalysis, <laughs> communal, collective psychoanalysis. We all needed it. Some of them were musicians. We all needed it as to how we could deal with this trauma called Mahler 6. When you do that sort of thing, people take part in it. Don't forget it. Yes. They know then that music, why music is relevant in their lives. They know why they need music. They know why they're connected to Walt Disney Hall, why they're connected to this orchestra, why they're connected to, to Gustavo Duramel as a conductor. And it does make so much of the rest of the musical world look ossified yes. and, and sclerotic yeah. and almost beyond redemption. But all it takes is one act. It takes one musician. It takes one person with an idea. And suddenly the whole thing springs to life again and a passion to connect on a far deeper level than the practices that are really largely self-serving. And this isn't anything new. Handel said, you know, when, when, when they gave the first performance of Messiah in London, the world premiere was in Dublin, then they brought it to London, and a member of the nobility came up to Handel afterwards and said, uh, Mr. Handel, you have entertained them mightily tonight. And Handel replied to him, my lord, I do not wish to entertain them. I wish to make them better. Mm. That's what music is there for. It's to mm. make us better people. Mm. Get real. Yeah, yeah. That's that's and that's that's exactly what millennials, young people, sense the shallowness in our culture. Are seeking something deeper. I was actually talking with an organist, an organist of all people. You know, we mm. were thinking that churches are dying, and yet he's reporting from the American Organ Society that there are more organs being built today than ever before. Young people are seeking the numinous experience that they're just not getting in modern culture. And they're, they're seeking Fantastic. after something. It's, it's really uh, remarkable. Absolutely wonderful. Mm. Absolutely wonderful. It, it, it's, there is no part of classical music that cannot, with a little imagination, be revived in an inspiring way. Uh, you can start, you know... You, you can make a whole show out of full Elise if you want to start at the very simplest, very lowest level, or you can go to Stockhausen and Zinarchis. You will find something that can connect to people there. Mm. I'd like to close with simply asking you what's next on your horizon? What do you have cooking on your plate? 
Oh, I've got a biography that I'm just starting and there's another major work of history that I want to do and there's another novel and there's the film and <laughs> <laughs> and there's, you know, trying to, to take slip disc into the 22nd century. <laughs> there, there is so much to do, Hugh. There, there, is, there are so many challenges, but they're enjoyable challenges. Mm. They, they really are enjoyable. I... I've had no room for depression in my life. <laughs> you were truly living an artistic life, bring really ringing every moment from every minute. It sounds like what a what a blessing, what a tremendous outlook. <laughs> thank you, Hugh. Norman. Thank you so much for spending time. I, I hope one of these days to get to take you out to dinner in person. My pleasure. I will look forward to it. For links to Norman's websites and the musical excerpts featured in this episode, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to get the latest updates on future episodes. You can also subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or with your favorite podcast playing app and get new episodes automatically downloaded onto your smartphone, tablet, or computer. If you enjoy these stories about making music and the things that move our souls, please tell a friend about this show. And consider posting a short review on iTunes at amusicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you so much for your support. Special thanks to Allison Pockris, our associate producer, for her assistance in putting this episode together. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.